Today we're going to talk about procedural generation and the problem of if, if you have a room in your game and you want to fill it up randomly at runtime with, uh, with stuff. You want the stuff to be different every time so that the player can have a, a more, it increases playability, you have a more interesting experience because you have more variations every, every time you play. Um, so for example, if this is a room the player might be in, then you might want to put little objects in it scattered around like this, you know, in random, in random places. Okay, and to do that we're going to use the random number generators that we've been developing over the previous few videos. Now the problem is that uh, the random number generators that we have only generate one value, but each of these guys is is a two-dimensional value. Okay, we'll call it X and Y. So there are really two values here. So in order to get our random number generator to generate uh, random numbers for any location in this room, we really just call it twice. So it's, it's that simple. So if we want to generate a two-dimensional vector here, X and Y, and we say, this is, is going to be our first pass. We say rand and rand again, rand again. Okay, so we generate one random number for each of the coordinates in our game's system. So for example, if you're running a 3D game, then you would call rand three times to get three-dimensional uh, coordinates. The problem is that rand will give you a value between zero and r where r is the maximum value that this random number generator will spit out. What we really want is a number that will fit inside this room because r is going to be a huge number. r is going to be like 2 billion or something like that. We just want something that will fit inside this room. So supposing that the room's coordinates are negative 20, 20, negative 20, negative 20 here, and negative this will be 20, negative 20, 20, 20, and negative 20, 20, right? So these are the coordinates that contain the room. Um, and we want our position to be inside those coordinates. So we have to map the zero to r interval to something that goes from negative 20 to 20 a new interval. And fortunately for us we have um, the exact sort of thing that will do that. We covered it in one of the previous videos. If you remember we used the modulus operator. In this case we might use modulus 41 because there are 41 values between negative 1 no, between negative 20 and 20 including 0. But the problem uh, with that is that if you use modulus, then you're going to get only a series of discrete locations that your objects can end up in. This modulus operator is an integer operator. In other words, you're not going to get any output values that are not also integers. That's going to be a problem because we want we don't want our objects lined up along along, you know, lines, invisible lines through our through our output space. We want to be able to have an, at an object at like, you know, 4.5 or 6.8 or something. So modulus isn't going to cut it. We need a new approach. And that new approach is actually an old approach. Uh, we can just reuse the remap function that we developed in a previous video. And I have a link to it up on the screen right now. So here is rand, and if you remember, if you recall, remap takes, our first argument is the input number that we're going to map from one interval to another. So the first interval is going to be 0 to r, and the second interval is going to be negative 20 to 20. So this remap function takes in this random number, and this is the input range, 0 to r, 
and this is the output range negative 20 to 20 so it'll just give us the uh, value that we need here and of course we have to do that twice one for each dimension so we do it again remap rand from 0 to R from negative 20 to 20 that'll get us the vector we want and uh, when we do this many times say we do it 20 times that will get us as many you know we can do it as many times as we like to fill up our room with random uh, random things chairs or tables or rocks or brush, brush, brushes or bushes or something whatever you like and this process um, is called generating white noise white noise or the the common way of referring to white noise is static so for example if you're flipping through channels on the radio or your television and the reception is not good you would call what you see static but it's really a, a type of noise it's white noise why is it white well all the different kinds of noises have colors associated with them and they are vaguely associated with the kind of noise that um, that is generated and today we're going to develop two different kinds of noise and the first one is white noise but the problem with white noise for our purposes is that it may actually because it's completely random it may actually generate two objects that are too close to each other like this that are overlapping that wouldn't be very good for our purposes we could move the second object but that might get kind of expensive and so I'm going to show you another technique for generating noise that prevents this problem. I'm going to draw another box that's slightly bigger so that we can see what's going on. Okay. So the approach is to divide our output space into a number of cells like this. And then in each of these cells, and so on. In each of these cells, we're going to do one white noise sample. So in the first cell, we might land here. In the second cell, we might land there. In the second cell, you know, it's random. And even if, for this cell, we get a white noise sample that's completely on the right boundary, and for the adjacent cell, we get a left noise, uh, a a white noise sample completely on the left boundary still the two objects that we're generating are not going to to intersect they're not going to penetrate into each other because we limit each sample to be inside one of these boxes and this technique is called blue noise why is it blue well I think when someone decided to name it, they were running out of other colors. We already had pink noise and brown noise and other noises. And so they just picked blue. But for our pur purposes, it's called blue noise. And the idea of blue noise is that it has a consistent frequency. If you remove the orange boxes here, you'll see that you'll, your blue uh, samples are spaced more or less the same distance apart, which is about what we want. Um, in real life, when you have, for example, trees and woods, you never get two trees that are exactly right next to each other. They're always scattered somewhat uniformly around. Um, and so blue noise is a fair, at least beginning representation of the sorts of of distributions that you have in nature. So this is our first step in procedural generation, is generating this blue noise. And now we're going to go to the code section and see how we would do this in C. Now I've taken the liberty of filling out a, a procedural generation loop right here that 20 times creates a prop and sets the transform here exactly like we saw in the video. We create a vector and we do this remap function. We call random two times and we map everything from negative 20 to 20. So it's exactly the way we discussed in the video. And let's see the results that we get. Uh, 
So what happens is, is exactly what we were afraid of. We have these two boxes that are penetrating into each other. And that's not good. We don't want our boxes to do something that's not physically possible. So let's, but as you can see, other than that, if we t if take the whole picture, we get what we want. We have boxes scattered around um, the, way we, the way we want. We just don't want them to penetrate like this. So let's comment this out. And we have to do a little bit of pre-math, okay? We have to, and you'll see why I'm doing this in a bit. Let's find the entire size of our space in total. And that is going to be 20 minus negative 20. That should get us 40. So if you start on one side of our room and walk to the other side, you walk through 40 units. Now we're gonna calculate the cell size, and that is the entire size but divided by how many cells we're gonna make. We're gonna make five cells just um, in this example. So 40 divided by five is eight. Each cell is gonna be eight large, eight units large. So now let's make some loops. We type this junk that we've typed many times before, a for loop. If you're not sick of for loops by now, well, I certainly am. So we got to calculate the minimum and maximum extents of each cell. We're going to do this by starting at negative 20, which is the, like, you can think of it as the far minimum value or the far left value. And we're going to start working our way up through the values. So times cell size plus cell size times i. As i grows in this for loop, it's going to get multiplied by the cell size. And we're so, so we're going to get, uh, blocks the size of each shell. I hope that kind of makes sense. <laughs> we're going to do the same thing with the maximum, except we're going to use cell size times i plus 1. So this will be the minimum and maximum coordinates of the current cell that we're working with right now. And then the last step is to shrink the cell down a little bit so that so that it resembles our image before you remember the cells weren't actually touching. There was some space between the cells and we want that to make sure that no two objects in our, in our blue noise uh, are touching. So we're gonna do this again for the other dimension. So I'm just gonna copy all this stuff and make it say Y instead of X. Uh -huh, uh -huh and J instead of I. And now we're ready to generate our props. Okay. Uh, fixing the formatting here. So now when we generate a random number, instead of taking it from zero to R to negative 20 to 20, we're going to take it to the extents of the cell that we calculated. And this is going off the screen for you, but I'm just copying the Y value here, and I think I can scroll right. No, I can't scroll right. I will do this. There, now you can see it. So we're going from Y min to Y max, and from X min to X max here. And let's see how that changes things. There we go, now no two boxes should be touching. They come close, but they never touch. And if you were worried about, if you were worried about the boxes looking like they are aligned in rows because we made these cells and we put each one in a cell, you can see that they don't really look like they're aligned in rows. This is the benefit of blue noise is that you get this even consistent frequency of, of noise. Your boxes are evenly spread out, but they still don't look like they're neatly contained in cells. So this is good. Next week, we're going to learn more procedural generation algorithms, more types of noise, and probability density functions. See you next time.